alone or even on the test alone, you'd integrate other data. Yeah. How did you administer the MMPI-2 to Ms. Hurt? I provided her the test on an iPad. She essentially had her own little desk area and then an iPad. She hit start, it provides her with the instructions and then the it gives her 567 statements in order. For each one, she taps true or false. What did you learn about Ms. Hurd from the results of the MMPI-2? Quite a bit. I, um, I wrote up a 25-page interpretation outline. Um, it has numerous, numerous scales. So one of the reasons I like this measure so much is that it can tell you so much about multiple different traits and tendencies and mental issues. Um, one of the primary things I learned was that um, she had a very uh, sophisticated way of minimizing any personal problems. Um, I also learned that she tends to uh, well, there were a number of characteristics that were consistent with the eventual diagnoses, but um, some of the primary characteristics, and I'm going to try to condense 25 pages here, were essentially um, externalization of blame, uh, tending to have a lot of inner hostility that is attempted to be controlled, um, a tendency to be very self-righteous, but to also deny that self-righteousness and to judge others um, critically uh, against these sort of high standards for moral value, but also to deny doing that. Essentially to, to claim that one is uh, uh, very non-judgmental and accepting and yet very full of rage, really. And, um, and these aren't facts, but it, her scores essentially correlated, so they were consistent with other people who obtain these scores who have been shown through many, many, many studies to have these very specific traits. So externalization of blame, um, a lot of inner anger and hostility, sometimes that anger among these groups with similar scores, these people might have that anger kind of explode out at times. They tend to be very passive aggressive. They may be self-indulgent, very self-centered. Um, they uh, could use manipulation tactics to try to get their needs met, very needy of attention, acceptance, approval. Um, they tend to uh, distance people who are close to them. Initially, they may seem very charming. They're very socially sophisticated, actually. That was a major component on there. Um, they have a capacity to kind of offer some of their faults, but uh, in a way, but only the ones that people think of lightly and can all relate to. And so they can present as very fair and balanced, but in actuality, they really might uh, uh, be very judgmental of others and unaware of problems in their behavior and their thinking. So after you uh, provide the, the examination via, via the iPad, what do you do? So once they've completed the test, you can have it scored by the computer immediately. Um, it's a very, very complex test to interpret, but right away you get a list of what's called critical items, and these are just some, uh, a couple of the items, the statements that are presented that are more um, clearly symptom-based, and I always follow up with the examinee. Some of these might have to do with suicide. Some of them might have to do with other symptoms that you just like to get a little bit more information on because sometimes an examinee might tell you they're completely fine when you're doing your interview with them and that they have no symptoms. And then when they take the test, it says that they're having trouble sleeping or they struggle with nausea all the time or they feel very anxious. And so you wanna follow up on that. Okay, uh, what's a code type? A code type, let me uh, think of how to explain this very, very simply. So the main scales, and I keep referring to scales, these are just uh, the main scores that come up on this test. We um, can refer to them as codes. And when I was saying that Ms. Hurd's scores could be compared to certain groups of people that had been researched before to obtain similar scores, the research has shown that certain people will have certain scores that kind of spike on this, okay? And so all of those traits that I were descri was describing,
those are traits that are found in these code types. So it means that number two, score number two was high and score number six was high. And so if we have those two scores were both high, then that's a two six code type. And what these code, code types- type, What code type was misheard? Misheard had the clearest code type was three six, but then she also had some other code types that were less significant. What characteristics are associated with a 3-6 code type? So a 3-6 code type, a lot of that anger is expressed in this code type. Um, there can be actually a lot of cruelty, uh, usually with people who are less powerful. Uh, actually, when you see this code type, you want to, if you can, to follow up with subordinates co-workers, people who may have observed their behavior more closely. The three six code type is very concerned with their image, um, very attention seeking, uh, v very prone to externalizing blame to a point where uh, it's unclear whether they can even admit to themselves that they do have responsibility in certain areas. Uh, a lot of suppressed and denied anger, but the anger is very present, will explode out, and a lot of issues in their close relationships. How does Ms. Hurt's code type uh, fit in with your overall opinion as to personality disorders? Well, um, this might be an appropriate time to describe a little bit about these personality disorders, because I think what you'll hear is that there's a lot of consistency there. Uh, so borderline personality disorder is a disorder of stability. It's instability, and it's instability in personal relationships. It's instability in their emotions. It's instability in their behavior, and it's instability in their sense of self and their identity. And that instability is really driven by this underlying terror of abandonment. So one of the key features also of this disorder, and you, you, all of it is like pistons of an engine kind of firing off and igniting one another. But when somebody is afraid of being abandoned by their partner or by anybody else in their environment and they have this disorder, they'll make desperate attempts to prevent that from happening. And those desperate attempts could be physical aggression, it could be threatening, it could be harming themselves. But these are behaviors that are usually very extreme and very concerning to the people around them. Um, uh, the anger is typically what, sadly, it's counteractive, right? So the thing these people fear most is being abandoned, but over time, the anger, the explosive anger that they show when somebody is uh, needing space or when somebody's really not doing anything wrong because a lot of times they read into things that they perceive as being a slight to them or being somebody intending to harm them that actually isn't happening they'll exaggerate it um, and they'll explode, they'll react in this heightened manner that is just exhausting for their partners. Oftentimes their partners will uh, try to make them happy at first and really allow themselves to be a punching bag thinking that they can somehow solve this problem, that somehow they can make this better and eventually it just overwhelms them. Histrionic personality disorder is very Before similar. we move on to that, okay. um, are you familiar with the term emotional reactivity? I am. What is that? So emotional reactivity is very common in the diagnosis. So essentially, uh, like I said, there's instability in emotions. People with borderline personality disorder are often misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder because they can be up and down. They can look very depressed then they can look very elated, but these changes are happening within a matter of hours. Somebody with bipolar disorder, these are this is a clinical depression lasting days, weeks, a clinical mania where sometimes they even need to be hospitalized because they're so grandiose, they clear out their bank account and go to Vegas and spend it all. They're acting in some very bizarre ways. With uh, borderline personality disorder, you're having these fluctuating moods constantly, and again, this hypersensitivity to being slighted or feeling offended, really driven by the fear that if you're offended or slighted, if the therapist comes in two minutes late, or if somebody shows up to dinner two minutes late, that they might be abandoning you. And 
it's not as if the borderline is considering themselves abandoned in that moment, but they just know that they have this overwhelming emotion and there are no attempts to control that emotion. There's no, there are no attempts to regulate it. So if they're in the middle of the restaurant and they feel offended, they're gonna start the fight. Uh, people are going to see it or they might just start crying or break down, but they'll make a lot of accusations and that reactivity is when you're gonna just, you're gonna see a lot of this escalation in the bizarre behavior. They can react violently, they can react aggressively, they will often physically prevent their partner from trying to leave if their partner wants to get space from all of this intense emotion. And oftentimes they will uh, be abusive to their partners in these situations. Sometimes they'll physically restrain them from leaving and become injured that way, but also, People with borderline personality disorder, it seems to be a predictive factor for women who implement violence against their partner. And one of the most common tactics that they'll use is actually physically assaulting and then getting harmed themselves. But mostly, um, we call this administrative violence. So essentially, this is saying that they'll make threats using the legal system. So. Um, they might say that they are going to file a restraining order or claim abuse, or they might do these things to essentially try to keep their partner from leaving. In the moment, again, they're not consciously thinking, I'm gonna keep my partner from leaving right now. They're just thinking, I can't stand this. I hate my partner. They went from idealizing to suddenly devaluing because of the hurt, and they'll do anything to express that big emotion of anger. Your Honor, may we approach all right, yes, sir. Okay, um, you indicated, uh, you were talking about emotional reactivity. Uh, what, if any, emotional reactivity did you uh, observe in your review? And let's do this one at a time. Okay, so there were uh, a couple indications to me. Uh, first, uh, I can sort of think about it with the treatment records. So particularly uh, Dr. Um, Cohen Connells. Am I getting the name right? I feel like for some reason in my mind, I might have just reversed it. Uh, but Dr. Cohen's records, <laughs> I did reverse it. Uh, he actually refers to this reactivity quite a bit and to Ms. Hurd's temper. And that, that temper, it's often branded, or being hot-headed, is really characteristic of uh, borderline personality disorder. Um, as is their ch very charming, personable nature. It's, it's, this is a disorder of contradictions. Uh, in Nurse Filotti's notes, um, she had, I thought there was something interesting. She references a night when they're out to dinner, I believe in London, and she provided positive reinforcement to Ms. Hurd because Ms. Hurd had been uh, disappointed by a mistake made by the server, and it sort of references how previously she might have criticized the server or be, become upset by that um, and that she didn't this time and so that that had been some a sort of a, a step forward. Uh, and uh, there was also an indication actually in Dr. Hughes's, uh, Dr. Hughes is a forensic psychologist who had been appointed by Ms. Hurd to conduct as, an evaluation as well. In Ms. Hughes's interview of Ms. Hurd, Ms. Hurd disclosed that she had 
cut her arm in the past, which is a typical reactive type of thing somebody with this diagnosis can do. It's one of the symptoms. Um, and that's sort of all I can think of top of my mind from the treatment records. Moving into um, some of the declarations um, or deposition testimony, what struck me was Ms. Raquel Pennington's testimony. Um, she's a former friend of Ms. Hurd's and she indicated, she told a story about, I suppose they were shopping for Thanksgiving accoutrements, something to prepare for Thanksgiving, and Ms. Hurd struck her in the face, sort of out of the blue, um, which is, I, I thought was interesting because that is one of those signs of borderline personality disorder where if a, if a friend or a loved one isn't meeting your needs in that moment, um, borderline, the borderline personality personality disorder, things are in these extremes, this black and white, we call it splitting. And so that person goes from being idealized, the perfect person, to dumpster. They are totally devalued, they are the worst friend, they don't care anything about me, I have better people around. And then there will be a repair because the person with this disorder does feel remorseful after they have these reactions, angry, tell their friend off. But over time, it wears away at these relationships. And so what you'll usually see is many, many transitions in their friendships over the years. People who have sort of fallen by the wayside, who were really very close-knit at one time, and then, but there's not a lot of consistency in the long term. You'll also see that with their intimate relationships, many, many relationships, but none that are particularly long-term. How does borderline personality disorder relate to identity issues? So again, that instability also travels toward identity. And when I was describing personality earlier, I was talking a little bit about those traits we have that help us know who we are. When you have borderline personality disorder, that actually is not something you understand. So uh, people with this disorder actually take on the identity of the people they're spending time with because it's comforting. It's very uncomfortable to not know who you are. Some people with this disorder will describe a feeling of emptiness when they feel like they've been abandoned because now they don't know who they are in the world. And so when somebody with this disorder is going through that initial enmeshment phase with new people and they're idealizing them, they often will take on the identities of those people. So they may mimic them in a lot of ways. They might mimic the way they dress, their interests, the way they talk. Um, and for this reason, the people around somebody with this disorder kind of from the outside may feel like, 
wait, I thought you were this way, and now you're advocating for this, and this is your new main interest in life, or the thing you're throwing yourself into all completely. Music tastes might change, hobbies will change, the way they dress. Okay. Um, in addition to borderline personality disorder, I understand that you uh, diagnosed a, another personality disorder. What's that? So histrionic personality disorder, and these are really two sides of the same coin. Um, they belong to the same cluster. We call these clusters. It's a way to organize personality disorders in that DSM. And this cluster is described as the personality disorders that are dramatic, erratic, and emotional. Okay, so unpredictable, but really having to do with emotions and relationships. They're very similar. Whereas I was saying that borderline personality disorder, a lot of the key features that you're going to notice are instability. When it comes to histrionic, a lot of the key features are going to be drama and shallowness. Similarly, with borderline personality disorder, there's this, under, uh, this underlying drive of avoiding abandonment. With histrionic personality disorder, that underlying drive is to always be the center of attention because if you don't have that attention on you, it feels similarly to borderline personality disorder. You feel pretty empty. Like you don't have that sense of being or of value, okay? So whereas borderline personality disorder might have more of the visible reactivity if somebody seems to be leaving, with histrionic personality disorder, what you're going to see is extreme discomfort with not being the center of attention, extreme efforts to be the center of attention. And when they feel that they're not the center of attention, you will see some strange things, making up stories to try to get attention, often taking on a victim or a princess role. Those two roles in particular are pretty consistent. Seeking caretaking. Borderline personality disorder is similar because with borderline personality disorder, these shifts of identity and the splitting, you might see somebody go from being in the DSM, it describes it as a needy supplicant of help, seeking the perfect caretaker, to suddenly being the avenger against injustice or thinking that their partner is a terrible person. With histrionic, what you'll see is somebody who um, wants to be the center of attention, has sort of that impressionistic speech, very flowerly, uh, very enthusiastic, but nothing's really being said. The moment your attention wears away because they're so demanding for attention, that's when they might take the victim role or the princess role and even make up stories. Sometimes those stories are to bolster the victim role. Sometimes those stories are just to make them look more interesting or accomplished in their mind so that they can get respect and attention that way. Is there a relation between histrionic personality disorder and attractiveness? attractiveness? <laughs> there is, strangely, and this is always one of the trickiest things to talk about because uh, how do you, I mean, how is that a symptom? But characteristically, people with this disorder are very, very interested in looks, um, but more importantly, they utilize their looks to get that attention, to get that respect that they're seeking. And so this type of everybody, um, characteristically, they actually couldn't even be subtly, and when I say flirtatious, I'm not talking overtly sexy, but uh, kind of inappropriately flattering. Sometimes they act in a kind of a girlish way to be cute and to a gender attention. And this will even occur in their therapy relationships as a way to sort of avoid getting negative feedback or criticism. Oftentimes they'll bring the therapist gifts or be distracting um, if they engage in therapy uh, because they just don't want any criticism. They want the therapist to like them. Does the intelligence of the affected person bear on the manner in which these disorders present? Excuse me, I choked a little at my water. Uh, it, yes, and I think one way to think about it that's probably a little more accurate than just intelligence is in psychology we would describe this more as sophistication. So street smarts, so to speak. Um, the way, for instance, I've had many clients who have borderline personality disorder who are um, 
messy and really clearly suffering. And um, they might be difficult and all over the place and yell at you in the middle of session, but it's so, uh, uh, it's not tailored. It's so much easier to work with because of that just openness and rawness of it, genuineness. Sometimes you'll have a more sophisticated presentation. There are nine symptoms and only five have to be met. So there are a lot of different combinations and different ways it, it can present. And sometimes you'll have more of uh, a petulant version of this where it really shows when you push the button and you're kind of, whoa, what was that? So somebody who's really productive, high functioning, successful, and you get to know them and you think they're fantastic because they're so interested in you too. And you might not realize it, but they're mimicking you perfectly. So you're really just kind of falling in love with this new friend who is being you. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you say something that they think is offensive and you can't, in, even in your wildest thoughts, understand how that could have offended somebody, but their reaction is so strong that you kind of buy into it. Gosh, maybe I did say something offensive and, and you feel bad about it. So that sophisticated version, they can be a little bit more calculated in the way they present. They tend to kind of hit you where it hurts a little bit more. And they can be actually very, very destructive. What conclusions were you able to draw about Ms. Hurd's sophistication from her testing? Well, from her testing and from her presentation, she's she was very likable. But her testing in particular um, showed that she approached it in a manner that, uh, remember I told you about those, those scales that are pretty neat. Um, she approached it in a manner that very clearly minimized any psychological dysfunction. Um, not just that, but really presented herself as free of any problems. And she did so in a way that was very, um, very sophisticated, not obvious, um, by responding to questions that most people might not notice would, were trying to detect that. Uh, how did you determine that? So that's based on a particular scale on the MMPI-2 that is designed specifically to detect a type of responding that's a little bit more clever, a little bit more sophisticated, minimizing problems in a way that most lay people probably wouldn't understand, and even providers, very difficult to detect. You mentioned that one of the characteristics of borderline personality disorder is emotional reactivity. How might that present in an intimate relationship? So I think it probably presents mostly uh, or you'd see the bulk of it in intimate relationships because of that regular interaction and the desire for your partner to meet all of your needs, to be the perfect caretaker. Also that um, the hallmark of the disorder with the splitting, so idealizing, devaluing, and the perceiving of all sorts of neutral events as somehow demeaning or disrespectful. Um, it's regular, escalations of anger, frustrated complaints, criticisms of your partner. But because the person with borderline personality disorder, first of all, they're more sensitive to things, they feel distress more strongly, and then that distress lasts longer. So these types of blow-ups go on forever, and they're very cyclic. It feels like you just can't get a resolution, and eventually the partner will try to leave, will want to leave to take a break. It wears them down, and that's when the borderline might explode and act very aggressively or violently to try to prevent them from leaving.